and we, we are, are here, here on deep, deep tracks, tracks only we are, we are so, so glad you are right joining us today gosh, gosh what, what a good episode good we have today today, today we talked to dan wilson of simi sonic who's also a songwriter <laughs> I, I almost could keep up <laughs> i could almost keep up you're better at that than i am at following you i think you no are. i'm not that okay. was real good i'm pretty my good brain at... starts glitching yeah i have literal glitches literal the Man, speaking of band names, literal glitches. Literal glitches. It is a, I mean, they're on tour with. You remember Mum? No. Mum from they're from like two thousand and three, two thousand four. Literal um, glitches. It was like one of those bands that you got burned CDs of. Like hey, you didn't listen to Mum, <laughs> like Architecture in Helsinki. I don't know any of these. Oh, you don't know either. I wasn't cool. I was <laughs> okay. a punk kid. I was oh, a yeah, yeah, yeah. hardcore you boy. Cool like I was, dude. I was so yeah. cool. Like yeah. on an index of one to ten. <laughs> like what? Two. Oh, dude. One being the coolest. But it was cool to be two. That's the whole thing. That's what's ironic about it. Oh, man. You know, um, uh, you know those dad's shirts. Is like I used to be cool. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I love those. I have a whole book of that. A lot of appreciation for that. Um, that's what my mom used to say about my dad all the time. Like your dad, he really used to be cool. <laughs> that's so so sad. I, I used to be cool, man. I know, and it was usually around the time when we were like telling him to like say, "Hey, dad, stop wearing like yellow fleeces." You know, he just buy fleeces, and they'd be like the most like bright color you've like, ever seen in your life. Almost you. I'm just kidding. It's kind of like those things that look good in a catalog, but then you buy them and you wear them. And yeah, you're like, this is not. It's like you got it from Wish. Yeah. So Jason, Jason here at Warsaw, we call it the red jacket. Because at one time or another, we both bought like a red jacket. Thought like, because it looked good in the catalog, but then you buy it and you wear it and you're like, no <laughs> guy looks good in a red and jacket. And you both bought this red jacket? No, no, no. But we oh, both okay. at one, some, one time or another said like, that red jacket looks awesome. Uh-huh. I'm going to buy the red jacket. And then you buy it and you almost never wear it because it's like, I look ridiculous in a red jacket. Yeah. Like, what kind of guy wears that, a red yeah. jacket? You have to really commit. A, a really cool person buys it and wears it. And the people that are just yeah. too scared don't. Yeah. And the, and the people too scared don't. Yeah. The people too scared don't. I have about four or five black jackets because I'm too scared. That's yeah. All I mean, I that's what I resort jackets. to all the time. Just black. Yeah. yeah. But, the, you know, then you walk in somewhere and you got black pants, black jacket, you got a black bag. Yep. It's kind of like this guy is ready to film a few episodes of some new Netflix series. That's what it looks like yeah, now. Yeah. You know, like I'm on crew <laughs> somewhere. I'm obviously not wearing that today. Yep. Um, I'm wearing tan. You're also wearing tan today, too. I love these earth tones that tan? we have going. I thought, I thought it was like, kind of sage. I'd, I'd call that dusty olive. Oh. You're wearing a dusty olive shirt. Dusty olive. What color is sage? S- sage. Dusty olive. I guess I don't know what color sage, sage is. More it's more like blue, a, It's more of it? a muted blue-green. Okay, it's more of like a... Yeah. Yeah, okay. My mom was a big color wheel girl. So, like, we were very versed on the color wheel growing up. <laughs> I just picture a big color wheel girl rolling around. Just... Yeah. No, I was the only one in kindergarten that knew the difference between mauve and burgundy. I you still, it, mauve is a brown, right? Mom, it's like a, it's like a dusty kind of a dusty rose. Dusty olive. Like a, like a, I've said dusty a few times, but it'd be like a muted, like brown, okay, rose kind of thing. Mom, uh, leave a comment if you disagree. Today on the show, we have um, what is he? He's an exciting. I was wanted to He's say like, I wanted to say the word. We have an exciting guest, but that is such a podcast. Yeah. BS cliche. Uh, he's a today person are, that's probably today written. We've got an exciting guest. I cannot wait to present him to you. Somebody who you probably nine. like five or more of his songs that he's written. You like and so you don't many know. songs yeah. that he's written, and you don't know that he's either written them or co written them. Mm-hmm. We are we have on the show Dan Wilson, uh, lead singer and principal songwriter of Semisonic, but he's also a very prolific songwriter all the way, harkening back to the 2002s, uh, writing songs all the way up until today with artists mm-hmm. like uh, Taylor Adele, Swift, Taylor Swift, Adele, Leon Bridges, uh, Jason Mraz, mm-hmm. Rachel Yamagata, Carol King. I mean, Antigram, the list, yeah. 
Fa- what do you say? I said Fantagram. Fantagram. I like that album that he helped. That's a, yeah, that's a good album. Uh, just a just a really like a corn maze of a mind to <laughs> to hunt through. I mean, it's really a special episode. Um, so yeah, we're gonna yeah. go through that. We're gonna see push play on Dan's brain, see what's there. Uh, but before we do that, I think one of the most <laughs> important things that you and I do together is. Forget that we go through band names. Yeah. B- b- band names. Band names. Band names. Band names. Eight nine. Uh, so today's band name. Do you want to go first? You can go. You can, well, mine's mine's better today. All right, I'll go first then, because I really feel good about mine. Uh, it's pretty heavy. That's it. It's no, 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 no. It's just, it's a heavy band name. Uh, but you're going to love who they're on tour with. And I doubt you even know who they are or remember who they Probably. are. Probably. I don't know anybody. Uh, this is a band. Their band name is Drenched in Stars. That's a good one. Thank you. Drenched in Stars. Drenched in Stars. And then um, their album that they just came out with, their debut album is Codes of Light. Right? Um, and it's kind of one of those, like, if you just Google image, like, Alter Bridge like tour art. It it looks like that. It looks like okay, that's really complex. I wonder what all that stuff means. That's kind of what it looks like. Uh, I think we should start including album art on these. Just means, AI generated. Well, that Just, means I had a, well, what if it's not what I want? Uh, yeah. So get better. At obviously, AI. Drenched in Stars, Codes of Light. It's a really <coughs> it's a really complex album cover. It kind of looks like the Trapper Keepers from the nineties. Oh yeah, like when you were in middle school, it had like a like a very futuristic scene with geometric shapes and a unicorn coming out of it. Maybe no, maybe no. maybe, but like ultimately, like 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 barber poles of power sources. Oh, okay, yeah, you know, I know exactly. I'm yeah, picturing yeah, yeah. It. yeah, like definitely that's the that's the Drenched in Stars vibe, and they are on tour with. Default. That's, Do you remember I'm Default? I'm lame. No. Can oh. you sing a Default song? Uh, this is not for real friend of you. I'm wasting my time. I'm wasting my time. time. Remember that song? I do remember that song. It was on the radio a lot. And I, I can't believe, I can't believe how much it was on the radio. That, I mean, that was... That kind of music in that time. It's is this two thousand three, two thousand two? It's kind of one of those bands, kind of one of those bands that, that that I feel like Creed opened the door for. Uh-huh. You know, so yeah, it's very Creedy, Creedy kind of band. Um, if we're talking about bands on here, we're not necessarily endorsing them. We're just saying that they're just. They're Are you part saying of that you don't endorse Creed? I or, endorse or default. Uh, no, I now I'm in a now I'm in a corner. Mm-hmm. So see what you've done. You've yeah. kind of put me in a corner to either I affirm sure or disaffirm both those bands. What I will say is Mark Tremonti uh-huh. of Creed is a brilliant guitar player and a brilliant parts writer, a brilliant mind. And they're great songs. Um, and I will say one of my favorite YouTube videos is Scott Stapp singing about the the Marlins like the baseball team. Like he has a song that he wrote about the Marlins baseball team. And that is one of my favorite uh, Scott Stapp videos. Like favorite worst? I just, that's all I'm going to say. I'm going to be pretty agnostic about it on purpose. All right. And so, uh, but they're on tour with Default. Where are you at? Where's your band name? (laughs) All right. Uh, This this band's been around for a while, but they're making a resurgence. It's Bad Graphics. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I like bad yeah. graphics. Yeah. They started out as like a sync licensing or whatever you would call it back in the day band. Just, you know, just in it for the money. Sure. That's a buzzword but, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Way to drop some buzzwords. <laughs> cool. Yeah. But they had some great songs. Um, yeah. Just think of like a high end Sonata commercial as on the countryside. Just, yeah. Uh, like, so, a, like a Phoenix kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> Silver Sun pickups. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, album name is Cutting Room Floor. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and they were, they formed at Yale University. So of course they did. Yeah, they did. They're one of those like, yeah, like they all made 36s on the ACT. Yeah. Kind of like Vampire Weekend or something. Super smart. Yeah. Like super. Speaking of super smart, we have somebody super smart on the podcast today. Yeah. Which so we've already talked about. But. We do. Um, 
Anyway, like I said, you know Dan Wilson from uh, the band Semisonic, but um, you also know him from several songs that he's co-written. So kind of in today's journey, we I think it'd be helpful for the audience to kind of hear Dan's origins. So where he's from, where he came from, how he got doing, uh, how we got doing what he's doing. <laughs> Is that the best? Here's how best he got doing. Say Here's the deal. We got to be really measured with our words because he went to Harvard. Yeah, he did. And so I didn't go to Harvard. I went to college in Oklahoma. Where'd you go to college? In Oklahoma. Right. So we got to we gotta talk super smart. I'm going to be so smart today. I'm going to talk so smart today because he's from Harvard. And do you think he knows Mark Zuckerberg? Dude, he probably does. He probably does. I bet. I Mark bet. Zuckerberg probably knows. I mean, he's, I'm sure he does know him. I bet, I bet Dan Wilson was on the Harvard Connection. I know. The Winklevoss twins are listening to this. And they're like, dude, oh, you owe us a copyright from saying Harvard Connection. <laughs> Trying to find everything. Oh. Uh, and if you haven't seen the movie Social Network, you have no idea what I'm talking about. Uh, I bet people still do, yeah. Yeah, but Dan went to Harvard. And honestly, we didn't even talk a lot about that. Yeah. But uh, Or what he even studied. We didn't even get there. But it's just impressive to see on his resume. And if you look on his All Music, which I am going to send you to allmusic.com, type in Dan Wilson and see everything that he's done. Um Look at those credits. You're going to be Man. impressed. So without further ado, let's bring them on. Dan Wilson, everybody. Dan Wilson. Everybody, this is Dan Wilson. You know Dan Wilson um, from probably one of the most popular songs that is uh, was really popular when I was growing up, but has stayed very popular because it's a very timely song for a special activity. It gets played uh, when when the event closes down, when the game ends, it's closing time yeah. from one of the greatest bands out of the, uh, out of the 1990s and the early 2000s semisonic. So that is Dan Wilson. Dan, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. Thank you for that welcome, Colt. Yeah, I'm glad that you said thank you because uh, today we're actually going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but if you look on Dan Wilson's resume, Semisonic is one of the smallest parts of that resume and that mm. activity. And, and Dan, you've kind of turned yourself into, um, I don't think the word prolific does it justice. Uh, mm. I would say... I guess we'll we'll stick with prolific. Um, you went to Harvard, so you probably have a better word for that. Uh, but a prolific songwriter um, who's been really grafted in into almost every angle of the music industry just in the last you know mm. two decades. Fantastic. So yeah. before we get there, Dan, uh, yeah. I got introduced yeah. to you through Philip. How did you guys meet? How'd you guys get connected? We were talking. Was it about the Kangra pedal? Yes, I think it was a Jared Sharf. They connected us. Jared and I had talked about um, the Kangra pedal because um, uh, a, a mutual friend introduced us uh -huh. during the pandemic, and we ended up chatting about that. And and then um, he said, oh, I'll, "I'll I'll arrange uh, for Walrus to send, uh, you know, send you one." Mm -hmm. And then we we hooked up with you on a like a, a phone thread yeah and i think somehow you and i ended up independently nerding out on yeah. guitar pedals and yes. <laughs> stuff like that pretty quickly actually yeah very quickly and that's, yeah that's fantastic that's and we, it, yeah. you guys stayed friends we stayed friends that's fantastic and that's when we started yeah. a band so and you started yeah, a band what's, yeah. so what's the yeah. name of your band he, he'll tell you it's dan knows it i think it was it called Leech Attack? Leech Attack yeah Leech Attack, we, yeah. Leech attack. i thought he texted yeah. me Leech Attach and so I said yes because I like oh. that. But it was leech attack. So <laughs> with an we exclamation mark at the end. I th yeah. we were arguing yeah. whether it could have an exclamation mark or not. Yeah, but then we decided to do the upside That's down when the exclamation band mark at the beginning. <laughs> the band name that <laughs> That's as far as we made it. As far as we got. The band name that popped into my head was uh Punching Floods. Punching Floods. So nice. I like yeah, Leech right. Attack. Leech Attack leech is attack. really good. That's really good. That's yeah. quick. I'm I down. think it just reminds me of how many bands I was in as a kid, which only had meetings yeah. and never actually jammed. How, yeah. 
<laughs> meet. Let's have lunch and talk about the kind of band we're all going to be in. Here's my idea. Well, Here's my idea. Here's mine. Yeah. 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 Just like argument, like yeah. basically an yeah. ongoing argument with the other guys. Yeah. I, so uh, I, I mean, would meet up. Go ahead. Not really lunch because I'm talking about like 13 year olds. I don't think 13 year olds get together for lunch. So we would always meet in the cafeteria and talk oh, about band and then, meeting at the cafeteria. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great way to flex, you know, telling everybody about your band while yeah, you're right. planning out the band. And here's what happened to me. We would then we'd meet at Robbie's house to start a band, but we'd start <laughs> like let's just warm up on a couple things. And then we'd warm up on uh, Nirvana and uh, in like some Green Day songs and then everybody would be tired right. and then we'd like go to the oh. gas station and, and buy Snickers and yeah. Dr. Pepper and then it was over and that was the last band practice <laughs> I never actually got anything done <laughs> so, so an enormous un, unacknowledged part of the music economy yeah. is the preliminary uh, group efforts yeah. that yeah. never actually even enter the, the stream of sound <laughs> yeah the warm up jams you know, two rounds of come as you are. Um, yeah. Okay, so so you were in bands growing up. Where did you grow up? Where were you and where are you now? I'm from Minneapolis. I grew up in Minneapolis. Wonderful. Uh, my, um, <clears throat> I'm in uh, Los Feliz in Los Angeles uh -huh. now yeah. and have been in L.A. for like 12 years. Um, okay. Uh, but... Most of my musical life was in Minnesota. Okay. My, my uh, brother and I, when, my brother Matt and I, um, we grew up sharing an acoustic guitar and teaching each other the, you know, the newest chord that yeah. some friend had oh, yeah. you know, showed us or whatever. The newest and, uh, chord. That's an album name. That is. You know, cool. some new chord, yeah. like how to play an F, you know, that was like, what the, yeah, yeah, yeah. this is, <laughs> wow, you know. But we um, we had a couple of bands in high school, and a, he had a band. Of, he had a very, very ragingly fast punk rock band that he played drums in, oh, and I bless his heart. subbed for him for a for a summer of uh -huh. of of lawn house parties in Minneapolis yes. playing the super ragingly fast drums. That's a, what year was that? That was whew, could that have been nineteen eighty. One long time ago, and then um, okay, you so, guys may not have existed. So I, when, I didn't I, exist. Yeah. yeah. So when yeah. I think of when I think of Minneapolis, I think of you know I think of Prince, you know, and around that time. What yeah, of was that? Um, was that an influence in the music culture when you were growing up uh, around that time? And, and how did that play a role in in your songwriting or your sound? Or was it you know because sometimes in Oklahoma, country music is. It's very prolific. So then you have a lot of country influence, but then you have a lot of anti-country influence because people grew up with it yeah. and they want to have like a, a rejection response as well. Is that mm. same kind of thing mm. happening maybe with Prince uh, in Minneapolis at some scale? No. Um, <laughs> good. <laughs> I like that question, but it's almost like the opposite. Like, um, yeah. When, like the, my first encounter with the music of Prince was I was at a party suburban party at a house where the parents were away and there was an older kid who went to hopkins high school mate matt fink who was the was, was the keyboard player in prince's band wow. and i i had everybody had known everyone everyone in town like all the musicians had heard about prince it was this legendary kid you know who was better than all of us and was like he, he was already even when he was like 17 or 18 he was already kind of on everybody's minds. And that was seen as like that and sort of punk rock, like um, the Suicide Commandos and the suburbs were like the main, that was the main thing. There was, I, I, I had no, going up north to my family's cabin, I encountered a lot of country music, but not in Minneapolis. Yeah. It was all funk music and yeah. punk rock. Yeah. So when I was at this party and all of us were standing outside and, this kid, Matt Fink, said, do you want to hear the new track that that that, that Prince has made? Uh, 
and we all knew that Matt Fink was in the in the band of this super cool guy. Uh-huh. And uh, so he played this song called Soft and Wet with his doors of his car flown open and, you know, yeah. the super loud stereo. And we listened to this funky song that was so embarrassingly sexy. And uh, it, was, <laughs> it just blew our minds. We were like, oh, my God. <laughs> That's incredible. incredible. So, like, to, to me, that's the that would be what you're describing as country from where you're from like for for me what it would be like prince like you would have to do country as kind of a re- rebellion against yeah the, the basically everybody thinking that prince was the god totally yeah. yeah i like thinking about a cabin up in minnesota did you guys have a cabin up in the boundary waters or somewhere up there not that far up about halfway up near grand rapids my my one of my uncles was a um an electrician and one of my grandfathers had been a plumber and yeah. one of them was a contractor. One of my other, my other grandfather was a contractor and my dad was able to carry heavy loads of concrete on, on a wheelbarrow. So they all made a house on a pretty lake in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. And then we would go up there like a lot in the summer That's and sometimes time snowshoeing or like skiing. That sounds so fun. I, uh, it was really nice. I have family, a lot of family up in Minneapolis and St. Paul area. And so I spent yeah. a lot of summers up at the, up at Spectacle Lake up there and cool. uh, up there, around yeah. some other lakes, things like that. Yeah. My uncle still, my uncle, yeah. uh, up in Minneapolis took me shopping to buy my first guitar and I got it at, I think music around oh. in St. Paul. Wow. So yes. That's cool. Yeah. Work with them. Yeah. Nice. Anyway. So how did you get from listening to soft and wet into into <laughs> semisonic tell us about that bridge uh right there so 1981 uh, i imagine semisonic gets together uh or did you go to college before that and then come yeah, I back went to, or i i went to harvard like like everyone brother, does <laughs> of course as one does when you're from when you're a mu- musician from minneapolis yeah my brother went there a couple years later and with literally the intention of being in bands with me. So we were in bands in Boston and traveling up and down the, um, uh-huh. the coast yeah. uh, and, and you know, not having a, a college social life or any kind of presence on this, but we were always out gigging. That's awesome. And uh, then when my, then when I finished college, I, I moved with my girlfriend to San Francisco to be a bohemian for a couple of years. Yes. And that was pretty great. And um, my brother, when he found a drummer, Elaine Harris, in, in, at Harvard and lured her to Minnesota to start a band. So they, they started this band called Trip Shakespeare with John Munson, the bass player. And then Matt, without telling the, the other two, um, recruited me to join the band which I'm sure to them might've been kind of alarming. (laughs) Oh, my brother's going to come and he's also going to be in our band, but that's what happened. And Uh we toured trip Shakespeare probably toured for like eight years. We got signed to A&M records. We had the ups and downs of that. We had, um, we were kind of a early, I guess we were a jam band before that was a category. Uh So that was bad timing on our part. It was, there was no movement yet. Yeah. But like all the guys from Fish would come to our shows when we played up in Vermont, things like that. We were like anybody who liked hippie-ish jamming probably uh-huh. was going to like us. Wow. And, and what did you play or do in that band? I I played guitar and piano in that sweet band. That's fantastic. Yeah, 8 years is a long time. Uh it, it was incredible. To be and you get to know a lot. Is that that is that more time than uh, than Semisonic was together? No, Semisonic did about so, the same thing. Same time. So about okay, the so same stretch of time. Talk yeah. about the transition from tricks. Well, how'd you get from? Is oh, Semisonic even done? No, in fact, Semisonic is not done. So actually, that band's been Look together for a very long time. Yeah. It's yeah. still an LLC. It still holds. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that the test? That was the test. I think just, we got to get real like, band. Yeah. Did you guys renew your form with the state of California? <laughs> You know, yeah, we did. Still, it's still a trademark. Still pay taxes. Uh, the uh, so talk about the bridge from oh. trips. Oh, go ahead. The, from trips Shakespeare, Trip Shakespeare to to yeah, to Simisonic. Simisonic. Yeah. Uh, well, I think Trip Shakespeare put out two indie albums. Then we put out two albums on A and M. 
And we kind of got to the point where it was such a quirky band. I, I kind of, we kind of got to the point where it almost felt like we maximized the number of fans that a band as quirky as we were, uh, and also as against the, um, what would you call it? Against the, 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 the parameters of a pop single. Yeah. We were just against all the parameters yeah. of a pop single. So w we kind of got as far as we could and we kind of sure. hit one of those painful points where everybody was arguing all the time and we were having lots and lots of friction. And my brother decided he was going to take a couple of years off and do something else for a while. And during that time, um, John Munson from Trip Shakespeare and, and I started jamming as a trio with Jacob Slichter who is a, uh, an old friend of mine who um, grew up in Illinois. I met him at Harvard and he moved to Minnesota before all this happened. Uh -huh. And then when Trip Shakespeare took a, a long break, John and Jake and I started jamming and we decided we were going to start a new band that was st structured in a, in a low stress way. So I, I figured out what the, what the, what that would be. I figured, we, uh, so we had like, I think we had four rules. We might've been three or four rules. Let's see if, which it is. Rule number one was um, life is more important than music. That's a good rule. That is a really rule good num rule. Rule number two was if we're working on a song for two or three days and it doesn't sound good yet, it's because it's a bad song and I'll write a new one. Uh, <laughs> nice. rule, I like this oh, rule. rule number. Lots of people need Rule that. number three a lot of, everybody needs that role. Yeah. Rule number three was um, if we're having a bad time in rehearsal, we're going to go down to the Loring bar and have a drink nice. instead. And rule number four was we're not going to be a democracy. Uh, I'm going to have the last word. Yeah. I'm the tiebreaker of, of all questions. Uh -huh. But we try, we'll try to do everything as collaboratively as we can. And we're going to split the proceeds of whatever we do totally evenly so that nobody lives in a mansion and the other guys live in apartments. Nice. Those are great rules. Those I, just wrote, great. I just wrote all those, those down. Great rules. <laughs> those are awesome. We're about to start a band, so that's yeah. why. Yeah. yeah. You need the rules, yeah. Got the, yeah. 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 Those, that are, would be like that, those rules would be the kind of thing that was part of the meeting in the cafeteria for the forming of a band. It was like, yes. that was kind of classic almost. Yeah. A bunch of 13-year-olds deciding... All those wise Damn. decisions. I remember crafting songs. Life is more important than music. The 13-year-olds never mentioned oh, that. Oh, man, yeah. No, but we also, I mean, we worked on the same song for six months. That's so, Right. You, know, so you needed my rule number two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, so, it was a song called <laughs> Beautiful <laughs> World. <laughs> That's real. It's, it was, could you imagine? Oh, man. Oh, uh, so painful. Yeah. How many, <laughs> uh, there, there were no songs about how beautiful the world is at that point. No. And so we were going to be the first band to release Beautiful World. Well, there's a good instinct. I think it'd be contrarian is a good instinct, <laughs> but it's, to me, it's, it's so aspir, it's such a great aspirational cover. And the fact that it was a doomed song is so, <laughs> awesome. so doomed. Here's the deal. We played and we played a show in Stillwater and we were a punk band and our drummer got sick <laughs> that morning. Mm. And so mm. we played the show without the drummer. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Just two guitars and a bass with no drums. <sighs> punk show. Imagine yeah. that. It's yeah. as punk as it gets. Oh. My grandma came. I played in a, I played in a punk rock band wh where the drummer had the flu and during the show, leaned over and vomited into a bucket that he set there <laughs> <laughs> several no! times. That is amazing. Yeah, and oh he, my God. And this hero of music never stopped playing. That is he incredible. He just leaned over. He's the Michael Jordan. <laughs> what a guy. Bands. Did he keep time? He is the Michael Jordan. Yes. It never wow. stopped. That's incredible. <laughs> we would look back and we were all like laughing and sort of screaming at the same time. It was so bad. That just kind of proves the greatest things that have ever been done never get recorded or celebrated. I, I, Who would, yeah. I, I would have say that's, so one of, that's one of the greatest things. Like to play that's a show. Like Everest. It's like vomiting. climbing a mountain or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like <laughs> you just, you never hear about the guy that vomited through the whole show, but kept time. I mean, that's probably a reason we probably lost most of your listenership right now, <laughs> having told that story. So oh, it might be a reason we never hear that. <laughs> we, I was in a band and we played a house show and downstairs, but it had all glass windows behind us and i remember halfway through the show 
freezing, being like, I am freezing. <laughs> and our guitar player had fallen backwards and broken through one of the floor to ceiling windows. And it was, it was in Detroit and it was probably 15 degrees outside. And he was still playing with blood all over him. And I just looked back yeah. and I was like, why is he bleeding? Oh, I'm pretty much outside right now. And we kept the show going. And that was Noah. He used to work here. Oh, so. my gosh. It was. That's a little bit of the, I mean, in that moment, the music was more important than life. Yeah. Actually. Yeah. yeah. It's like, well, <laughs> I might as exception. well finish this because I'm about to have to pay for a big window. That so. reminds me of the end of Whiplash. <laughs> I was that? Have uh, you not seen Whiplash? I haven't. Oh, it's I know, brutal. I know brutal Dan movie. has. You need to go watch Whiplash. Yeah. I'll go do that. It'll yeah. it'll kill you. I mean, it's really intense. Well, that's the thing. It's like one of those things like, you know, smell this. I I, I don't know because it's really sad and it's, a, it's, it's really stressful, really sad, really makes you question what the point of being a musician is. And when you're done, <laughs> you're, you're maybe not better than you were before. It, so it's sort of like, yeah. oh, it, it, I found this in the fridge. Smell it. No. <laughs> I'm not going to smell it. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, you... But you need to watch Whiplash. Oh, watch Whiplash. It's really great. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, he's great yeah. at it. It's fantastic. Right. So it's new. Also, it's scary. It'll it's scare the only, you. It's the only music... Um, it's the only mu uh, movie about drumming where the drums on the, on the picture are synced perfectly with the drums on the soundtrack. Oh, why is that? It's like... Because everyone else is like, no, it's... I know that, that when they edit drums to sound... A video to sound or, or film to sound in most movies, they're like, nah, no one's going to notice like that the drummer's not playing that same thing. But this is like a really elaborate movie about really, really elaborate jazz drumming, and they and and it's all deadlocked to the picture. It's wow. just I, I felt so appreciative while watching this super sad, depressing movie that they really went to the trouble of yeah. lining it all up perfectly. That is awesome. Now you need to see it. Now I'm going to watch it. Yeah. I like you must. Yeah, you yeah. must. It's you got to smell this thing from the fridge too. It's really <laughs> awful. It's fantastic. It's still good. It smells yeah. good. Do you think it's still good. Good. the date still so yeah, it's fine. fine. That's not mold. I think one of the most interesting things that has been said so far uh and what I'd like to repeat for our listeners, because most people are either in bands, have been in bands, or in like side hustles, you know, whether it's mm. like a cover band for corporate events or wedding bands, you know, I was in a wedding band called right. the Party Bandits for a long time. Uh, mm. <laughs> uh, I'd like to read these rules. Uh, li life is more important than music. I think that's great. Uh, if a song takes two or three days, stop working on it because it probably sucks. Uh <laughs> If you're having a bad time in rehearsal, stop and go to the pub. Uh, not a democracy. Dan is the tiebreaker. And I think it'd be good if everybody employed this rule, but made you specifically the tiebreaker <laughs> in the band. Um, I'm working towards that. So yeah, many yeah. So we're going to leave your cell phone number in the show notes and, and people can just, <laughs> just leave you in FaceTime. Just do you. it 24 7. Yeah. I'll just 24 7 uh, yeah. moderate. Band. Dude, Dan knocked and my song. What down. I think is great is split <laughs> proceeds evenly. Um, mm. So while some people might take issue with like, well, I don't like that it's not a democracy. I don't like that there has to be a tiebreaker. But at the same time, there's financial incentive for everyone to have a say at the bottom because it is split proceeds evenly. I like those right. last two because they're kind of mutually accountable to each other. How do you arrive mm -hmm. at those last two? Well, I, I had been in a lot of groups where it was thought of as a democracy, but only because everybody wanted the opportunity to prevent something from happening if the need ar arose. Uh -huh. And that's different than, you know, that's, that, that's not a model for, for having a, a direction or a leadership. It's a model for like, it's a fearful approach to making sure you don't get railroaded. Uh -huh. And, and yet it causes more, you know, just log jams of group dynamics than, than is usually survivable for a group. So if, if, you know, if everyone has veto power over, over every decision, you're, you're kind of lost unless you have a very, very strong, um, unity of purpose, let's say. And if, even if everything comes up to a vote, um, 
you can't really say like you can't really say that everybody in the band is as good at deciding everything as everyone else is like yeah you know why is one person usually stuck with having to write all the songs well it's just because they're better at it and everybody kind of doesn't like that but that's how that works and so Uh why um why should deciding who engineers the next recording be equally everybody's strong suit maybe somebody's just really good at playing their instrument or or like my band is is peculiar semisonic is peculiar because everybody's kind of if they wanted to everybody could be a record producer and everybody's very like sort of um schooled i guess Uh it's kind of a super group lore yeah Yeah. and the lore of music it's like a super group without the pedigree sure um but but like everyone has a different role like i would say john a bass player in the band is more like the the bomb thrower in the band like musically he's like you know we're working on a recording he'll say there's something wrong with this i don't know what it is i can't put my finger on it but there's something about this is terrible you know i I can't listen to this recording any, you know, one more time, like, or, or, you know, can you send me, can you send me a version with all the mid range instruments muted <laughs> and I'll add, I'll add the things I think it needs, you know, uh-huh. but just a kind of like a, a kind of like person who's stirring the pot musically and uh-huh. like yeah. challenging the process musically. Not everybody, not everyone is good at that, you know, but in our mm-hmm. band, like that's one of the things that John is, we sort of trust him if he's got some, you know, a, if he's getting a bad flavor from something we're working on, we, we just kind of have to trust him on that and, and go about it in a different way until we get something that we all dig. So in a way that's a democracy, but it's different. It's more like a team, you know, with different roles and, and people don't want to be, people don't want to do everything. Yeah. People have their so, strong anyway. suits. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I I love that. I think that that's fantastic. And then, um, so you employ these rules, you start the band. Um, yeah. And I imagine that, you know, success didn't happen overnight. Um, but but no. kind of what was the, how did you get from these rules to accepting the, uh, the Grammy winning for uh, the Grammy, not nomination, mm. the Grammy award for best rock song of 1999? How did, what was, <laughs> what was the story in between there? Uh, well, Trip Shakespeare had toured so much that when Semisonic started, first of all, we did a, we did one run. We, we, the, the music is, uh, life is more important than music rule. We, we took it so seriously that for a short time, the band, we called the band pleasure because we just wanted to do it for fun. Yeah. So I wrote a whole bunch of songs. We did one tour of the Midwest, I think as pleasure. And we basically played all the venues we would have played with Trip Shakespeare you know, with maybe less people. And then we found out that there was a very successful funk band from the seventies called pleasure and we couldn't be pleasure anymore. So we changed the name of the band. Then we had to start again, again. And, um, (laughs) so then for like four Uh years, three years, we made demos in John's, uh, and Jacob's basement. Yeah. And uh, I wrote lots and lots of songs and I had sort of decided that I wanted to write things that could be played on the radio, but I wanted them to be really good. Mm -hmm. So we, we did a lot of like proof of concept. Yeah. We did a lot of songs that were like, okay, Dan, we'll, you know, we'll, (laughs) we'll try this crazy plan. So we did a lot of demos for that and we sent it around to the A&R people that we had known because of uh, Trip Shakespeare and the A&R guy, one of the people that had signed Trip Shakespeare to A and M, and then quickly was fired after that, which is disastrous in its own way. Yeah. Um, for uh, he had gotten another job somewhere else, and he heard maybe our third batch of demos. Like that, we did we did cassettes with four songs each. Yeah. And sent them to whoever sent us five bucks. And Love so it. he nice. heard the third. He heard the third batch of four songs, and basically contacted us and said we can let's let's try to make a record and we we at that time there were large companies trying to sign unlikely bands from the midwest you right. know to record yeah. deals and uh-huh. uh so that eventually that's that's how we ended up um kind of getting 
institutional support, I guess you'd say. But he was uh, this man, Steve Robowski, fantastic guy. He was also fired from, he signed us. Then he was fired from the label that he, we, he assigned us to. Oh. And they didn't want us anymore. Shoot. And oh they kind of, so we were halfway done with the record we were working on. And um, the head of the label said, we, you know, to our managers, um, we don't need Semisonic. We have Third Eye Blind. It's fine. You know, we don't need this band. <laughs> Seriously. Okay, and, yeah. And so, what year so, is this? This is probably 95 or 6. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. 95. Yeah. So then we, then we, then MCA bought our contract from Electra and we continued making this record called, that we called Great Divide because, first of all, we were flying over the Rockies to record it in, in LA. Yeah. And so that was the great divide. And also we had to take six months off between the first half of the record and the second, because we'd got, uh, we went into corporate limbo. Yeah. But anyway, we put that record out. And then the next, I thought that album was like full of smashes. Yeah. I thought, yeah, yeah, you know, we're going to have some hits. And we had some like radio, we had radio play and there was love and we did a lot of shows and got good reviews, but it wasn't like, uh, explosive, you know, anything happening. So the next time around, we got Nick Launay to produce us. And Nick and I kind of were in cahoots with each other. We were, we were like, this is going to be like an art project. This is going to be like an art record. Uh-huh. And it's going to be, we're going to do it like Abbey Road as opposed to like um, Meet the Beatles. It's going to be, okay. you know, live performances. And then we're going to mess them up as much as we can or add things or subtract things or, do, you know, be really experimental and whatever. Yeah. So. That ironically, that's the record that had closing time on it and became commercial, such a commercial success. Yeah, so that was tra- you guys tracked that live that record, like, like every it's, for example, every like um, closing time is me on a duo jet through a Soldano amp, yeah. Jacob on the drums and John playing bass, and then to that we added. Another me doubling the the duo jet, yeah, and no, a silver jet, Gretsch guitar. Yeah. Uh, we had Sounds we incredible. added me doubling doubling the silver jet, and then we had a string section come in and play those beautiful things in the middle, and uh, yeah. you know, but it was it was mostly a, a, a live record. I think there's two edits of from one performance to another. But the, the piano hook, who played the piano hook, what was the... John, bass player. Okay. Played gotcha. that. And that, that yeah. was an overdub, but he, he, when we learned the song, he was standing at the piano with his bass in his hand and playing the piano part and going, boo, playing the piano part, bo, bo, with his left hand playing yeah. the bass. So that's, that's how awesome. it ended up on the record. So, Dan, tell me about this. So, yeah. you have a song, <laughs> you have a song called Closing Time. So, when you right. tour and you play live, obviously yeah. the song is appropriately named and themed to play last. When you yes. tour, do you close the show with this song? Because if I were you, I would open the show <laughs> with closing time, you know, just to get, <laughs> and honestly, it's, and sometimes people don't suffer from this, but sometimes people do suffer from this. It's like, I want to just get the, I want to get the hits over with in the show so that I can get to the stuff that is fulfilling for me more to play. You know, I mean, how many times, you know, how many times has Bono had to sing, uh, you know, with or without you? It's like, all right, here's the part where I got to do with or without you. And maybe that's still fulfilling for him. I haven't talked to him. He doesn't respond to my texts, but like talk to me about kind of the, the dynamic of that where everybody is kind of drawn to you because they've heard this, the specific song, but there, right. if you go through uh, it, the album really is, it sounds organic and tracked live and it sounds, yeah. there's a lot of emotionalism to it, just in the textures yeah. of it. You feel like it's one of those albums where you feel like you really are in the room, in the process of the musicians making it. So it really is a, a, a I oh, think it's a, it's a piece of art, but, but tell me about what kind of the, the dichotomy of all that. Well, how was that for you? Well, the first part of your question, um, the reason Closing Time exists is because John and Jake were really, really, really tired of the song I was putting at the end of the set for every gig. Uh It was this very jammy song called If I Run, and it was just really loud and jammy, and I loved it a lot. And we got to play, John and I got to sort of battle each other. He had an octaver on his bass, Uh 
which is really unfair. But uh, <laughs> so yeah. we, we would like do sort of dueling leads on it. And it was very, but, and I was content to do that forever, but they, they, there was a, a rebellion and they said that we have to have a new song to end the sets. So that's why I wrote Closing Time. Okay. That's so and, cool. Uh, so, so it would be ironic if <laughs> after that we switched it to the beginning of the show. <laughs> so that's how that happened. Guys, I think I want to play Closing Time at the very beginning. I know this all happened I mean, for a reason. But. We, did, we did one show in Minneapolis uh, in 2017 where we played the entire album, uh, feeling strangely fine. And then we played a bunch of singles after that, but that, so that night was the only time we've ever played closing time first. And it was, it was epic. It was actually kind of great in that spot. See, I'm, I, like, I'm glad you did it one time <laughs> just for me. Just, yeah, that's yeah. Super cool. But I don't, I don't know what you're talking about, about not wanting to play the hits. I, 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 I know that there are people like that and I know that that's a thing, but I've never had that. Like, once again, John and I, John, the bomb thrower in the band, he would be like, let's not play the singles tonight. And I would go like, what are you talking about? Those were, first of all, those are our best songs. Uh -huh. like, are we really, are we really bored of the, of those songs? It's like, almost like the other it would be out? a breach of contract for the ticket purchasers to <laughs> oh, not man. play. Do they really want the to hits. be spared the, the song they love the best? Does the audience really like breathe a sigh of relief when you don't play the best song? <laughs> no, they don't. Oh, I don't know. Man. I'm not sure they do. You're making a I good think, decision. I think I said that because I have been at shows where where people will will throw out like play didn't you know they like say the name of one of the band's yeah. hits and then the yeah. artist is kind of like hey we'll get there bud you know like we'll yeah, get there yeah, like yeah. Da, da, da. Yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> then, so then i feel like um and this might be uh, you know due to a lack of showmanship on their part but i feel like they feel a little bit groaned you know because oh they're only here to hear you know the the other stuff but but i really some of these other songs yeah, are great like, so far too it's a funny thing because um Okay, here we go. I'm going to digress. Um, well, first of all, I think I've seen, I'm going to digress twice. Okay. First of all, I've seen Radiohead like six times probably, and they only played that song Creep once. And yeah. to me, that's wow. like, uh, an, uh, uh, I understand they, they didn't like that identity for the band and they didn't want sure. to be that hit, you know, alt rock hit single band but it is one of their best songs and it was amazing the one time i saw them play it but it was also the other shows i it's not like i was sad they they it was it was amazing you know yeah each time so would you have been um, sad though had you never heard it live i'm yeah. glad i heard it one time i actually yeah. am i like the song i think it's a really really amazing That's wonderful a great song oh, oh yeah song. It's incredible song. but if i meet somebody who tells me their favorite radiohead album is pablo honey i don't trust that person it's anymore slightly questionable yeah i know what you mean <laughs> yeah it's kind of like well, well okay. i'm not gonna say i'm not gonna tell you put it that way right <laughs> yeah. so there you go oh that's really you great. had another part to that or did you yeah, i can't remember the second part of the question it's like the second half that's my me. fault yeah way to go gosh i am philip yeah um that's okay so so you move from you know, you guys win a Grammy in 1999, or you guys win a Grammy for, it might have been in 2000, but you win a Grammy for the 1999's best, you know, rock single, rock song, right? We got nominated for a Grammy, Grammy yeah. but we didn't win that Grammy. As as our friends what? said over and over to us, we lost that Grammy. Who won? <laughs> One time Grammy you, loser. Like Dude, lose I've, lost, Grammy. <laughs> I've lost every Grammy since this has been going on. It's crazy. I... What a guy! I think Dave Barnes in Nashville has a show called Dadville. They had Bruce Hornsby on, and I think the title of the show is like Bruce Hornsby, seven-time Grammy loser. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> just, uh, I think I'm pretty sure he was okay with that. But it's a, who won best who song knows? that year? Who knows? Uh, best the best rock song was a song by Alanis Morissette. That was one of those. Oh. Awards so that you get from previous you? work that was better. No, it wasn't even one of her great songs. It was from a movie or some, and it, it wasn't. It was like it was most. It was because she had done so many good songs, and they forgot to give her Grammys for those. So she got this one. <laughs> one more thing on closing time, and then we'll mm. we'll move on. Um, I mm. think we play a game here uh, sometimes with guests, and we say, "Is the song iconic, or is it good, or is it both?" 
And so wow. it's really fun to have you on today because you are, you behold one of the songs that I would say, one is iconic and yeah. two is really good because sometimes yeah. we have songs that are iconic, you know, in our nation and in our world that I wouldn't necessarily say that those are like great songs, but it is iconic. Uh, yes. Like, and one like, of those examples is... I would I have examples like I would say like Blue like Eiffel sixty five okay you yeah. know that's like an iconic song I wouldn't say it's a great song yeah mm. that's a good but one. it's also a song mm. that I don't if I have to hear it it's like that's fun to listen to you know it's like I'm blue and you know what's with bringing that song up with people from Minneapolis I like that is that are they from Minneapolis wait no because Corey Wong was on the show and we talked about Eiffel sixty five. Yeah. Do you know Corey Wong? Met him uh, recently for the first time, like three weeks ago. Oh, wow. He's great. He's, you know, he's from yeah, the Twin Cities. He's an amazingly talented person. Yeah. Yeah. So good. Um, okay. So you move from Semisonic into, into really kind of, I think what you're doing now into songwriting yeah. and co-writing yeah. for people. How yeah. did you make that jump? And it looks to me like you're really comfortable in that skin. Um, and, yeah. So how'd you make that jump and how did you kind of make it? part of your day-to-day slash year-to-year, now decade-to-decade? Um, my, uh, when I was a kid, my parents had like 11 or 12 LPs. And one of them was uh, Tapestry by Carol King. <clears throat> and and um, Wait, your parents had 11 to 12 what? LPs. LPs. Oh, like records. great. Okay, yeah. thanks. Yeah. I thought you said like, uppies, uh, and I was like, "Ooh, that's no, a, no, that's no. a Harvard <laughs> word." <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know that one. No, you have to ask. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Somebody Google okay. uh, ten or twelve LPs. Okay, it, yeah, they had a very small, you know, record collection, and so we would listen to it was um, Abbey Road and Sgt. Pepper, mm-hmm. um, Carol King's Tapestry, Bookends by Simon and Garfunkel, Man. Um, uh, a couple of. Um, a couple of things that I didn't relate to, like a Johnny Mathis record and um, and a wonderful album called Encores by Julius Katchen, who was a cl- classical pianist. And it was literally all the, it was like the, it was like an LP of all the go-to classical music greatest hits. Yeah. Um, Bach, you know, two-part inventions and, and Mozart Sonata you know, 545 in C major and just, just the, the best. So we would like listen to those records in the evening and, and uh, I would read the credits and I, th- I'm pretty sure I learned about Carol King being a songwriter from, uh, for other people. Yeah. Because a couple of the songs on tapestry had already been hits for other artists, artists. And I thought of them as songs like you've got a friend I thought of as a James Taylor song. That kind yeah. of thing. Mm-hmm. And there was some, um, Will You Love Me Tomorrow was like by the Shirelles, you know, but there wasn't her record. So anyway, <clears throat> I, I, d- I got this kind of vision for myself when I was like 11 uh, that I was going to be Carol King. And then I think, you know, my brother and I ended up in bands and stuff like that. And we, you know, I, I ended up helping Matt, my brother, finish a lot of his songs. And uh-huh. I got good at, collaborating on a song and bringing it to you know over the finish line in that way yeah and so at at the point of semisonic being the most successful i was putting the word out as much as i could um that i wanted to co-write with people and it wasn't really a thing like rock person co-writes and makes hits with with other people you know it wasn't really it wasn't necessarily a lane for that but Mm -hmm. i asked and asked and asked around minneapolis nobody wanted to co-write a song and then I asked my publisher and manager to, isn't there somebody that I could write some songs with? And they, they set me up with a woman named Bic Runga, who's a fantastic um, uh, singer-songwriter from New Zealand. And we wrote a song that was in a movie called American Pie. So that was like, oh, this is kind of fun. This is actually a successful uh-huh. thing to do. And then the second call I got about doing a co-write was purely by happenstance um was carol king 
who wow. who call call waiting into a call between my manager and my publisher. Come on. And the publisher said, oh, can you hold Carol King's on the other line? Okay. And he comes back to the <laughs> okay. phone and says, oh, would Dan want to write a song with Carol? And <laughs> my, my manager's like, hmm, you know, maybe. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So I wrote a song with Carol King that ended up on All About Chemistry by Semisonic. And I loved the experience. And she was, it was like a masterclass. It was kind of amazing. You bet it would she be. Was, she was wow. fun to write with and she was snarky and uh-huh. clever and everything you'd want. Really, you know, really nice, but also her humor had a, had a sharp edge to it that I really yeah. liked. And and we wrote a song that I think was, I thought was really, really good. And then in the years after that, I just kept shaking that tree. And when I, when Semisonic stopped touring, cause my, um, my daughter Coco was uh, in the hospital for a year and then she was on a, a, a trach and ventilator for another two years and I just couldn't tour the way I had toured anymore. Yeah. So I just kept like waving the flag with everyone I knew. And I think the first co-writing session after that was um, with Rachel Yamagata. And we wrote a song that was on a yeah. record of hers. And and then... What year was that? We were, that was... Um, oh, boy. Like 2004? Uh, something like that. Yeah. Okay. And then there was a... Or three. Then there was another... Then that... She was friends with Jason Mraz. And yeah, she basically sent him around. And he and I wrote a couple songs for his record called Mr. A to Z. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then... Um, and then I think I also worked on a song of of his called details in the fabric that was on his next album uh the album which had i'm yours on it which became a huge hit and uh-huh. this time like i'm people are starting to think oh the artists like to write with dan you know maybe we'll maybe i'll write a song with dan yeah and, you know it was definitely not like i was writing smashes for for people I, they people just seemed to get a good song out of it and also we had a good time yeah. So and I just built. in the way now you're becoming the Carol King for everybody else. Yeah. You know? It's true. So yeah. Cool. So it's incredible. I think just a sidebar. Um, so I think it's interesting that you kind of derived at the vision for yourself and the what kind of where you wanted to go from reading yeah. liner notes. And yeah. I think I think liner notes and credits are are so important because obviously the voice that's on the record, you know, carries the vibe of the song for the most part. And that's the name that's on the album and all that kind of stuff. But there's so much work that goes into it that that we don't really see that really kind of creates the foundation for the vocal track to go over. Um, and, it, and, it, and also it's, it's just for those who want to, to look. There was, kind of a, there was kind of a long, sad, maybe 10 years when the... the CDs and had gone started to go away and internet was taking over yeah and there was no longer any credits on anything for quite a while before before sort of all music became reliable and seemingly you know somewhat complete mm-hmm. you could never find out who played the drums on anything for for yeah except asking other people like for like 10 years maybe but now i think it's we have our Wikipedia and our all music and it's like liner notes, yeah. right? It's sort of a similar thing. So I was going to go to, I was going to ask you, where do you go for, you know, liner notes? Cause I think Discogs was a thing for a while, but yeah. all music, yeah. I like all, all music. music. Yeah. You know what I wish and Spotify has gotten better about it is the credit. Like when you type in song or you go, you have to right click and yes. go down to song credits and it usually has the performer, yes. which is obvious. Yeah. The songwriters, which is great. And then they, I think they've recently added producer, like who produced it, which mm-hmm. I think is really great. But I'd like to see that expanded on like, who oh, played yeah. who played the 12 string on this guitar? Mm-hmm. Right. Or in this album? Yeah. You know, I want to know that stuff, yeah. you know? Yeah. Who did that slide solo? <laughs> right. Yeah. It's a, yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm on board with this agenda in a big way. I, I, I think uh, the the difference to me between all music and Wikipedia is that 
it's, I think it's harder for artists who want to hide that somebody worked on their record. It's harder for them to hide that on all music, but they can go in there and take the person off their Wikipedia page. You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I don't know why people would do that, but people definitely do that. And I've had a couple of situations where I've written a song and someone else wanted to sort of like say, you know, it was, they contributed more. And so, yeah. I'll, you know, someone will flag to me like, oh, Dan, do you see that thing that changed on the Wikipedia, you know, mm -hmm. about that one song? And it would be some sort of like, it's just somebody politicking. I think Wikipedia yeah, huh? is more uh, susceptible to that. But I actually love going, I, I love finding out who played the slide solo. That's, to me, that's great. Yeah. It's so fun. And I yeah. think, you know, as for musicians and, and, you know, hardcore music fans, you start to figure out that you don't necessarily like a genre or an artist. You really start to like a producer. Like I've started mm -hmm. to figure out like, mm. oh, I really, I really like Eric Valentine's production. Yeah. Oh, I really like Daniel Lanois's production. Yeah. Oh, I really like yeah. Tony Berg's guitar playing. Oh, you know, right. you just start to, you start to like love all these songs and then you start to look into all music and the liner notes and you start to see like, oh, it's because the same person Come thread, yeah. singing yeah. or producing all that stuff. So, yeah, same. No, li I'm glad you said that liner notes are so, and they're just so fun. I mean, it's just so fun yeah. to really see all the humans, you know, behind all that stuff. So if you're listening, um, go to some of your favorite I think a good, if you haven't really gone down that rabbit hole, figure out just some of the fa your favorite songs from growing up and look at the liner notes and then click the hyperlinks on that person and mm -hmm. then see what else they were involved with. I found so many yeah. fun, great artists just through that. There's another um, resource that's similar, parallel kind of universe, but similar. Teach us. A website, a website called whosampled.com. Ooh, okay. Mm -hmm. And it's good for hip hop records because you can you can go to who sampled and because you say you hear a, a, a new record that you love and it's got obviously it has a sample in it yeah who sampled is this kind of very encyclopedic um uh database where where you type in the name of the new song it gives you the several things that were sampled to make the new song and then it gives you all the other hits that you didn't realize use the same sample the drums yeah. or whatever it might be uh, you know, and other other songs. It's a similar kind of like way of like finding those cross connections between artists or or um, you know producers based on the samples they use for tracks. I love this. I was just thinking about this in my car this morning while I was listening to Caroline Palachek. I think is how you say her name. Yeah. But so many cool samples in there, and I was like, this sounds like it's from like the 90s like i was listening to this with paula abdul i swear it's like the same snare and there's then, names i, I haven't i oh, didn't know you i didn't on, know this existed you so now go who's you go yeah on. who's sampled who's sampled .com. i'm gonna find yeah. paula abdul on there i'm sure yeah 90s snare could be uh a, a whole netflix docuseries it could the ring <laughs> it's, it'd be called it'd be called the ring that's what it'd be called uh we should we should do that. That'd be really great sometime. Okay, so um, in your songwriting journey, um, mm. uh, who, what are some of the highlights? Uh, like, uh, do you mm. enjoy working on some of the longer projects where you're helping somebody with a with an album or maybe just a couple yeah. of songs here and there, like a day trip? Like, what are some of the yeah. highlights there, and what do you prefer? I like working more than one song with people. It's it. it Part, part of the business of uh, uh, around being a songwriter producer is that the the business kind of wants to everything to consist of first dates only like mm -hmm. the business kind of figures you're, you're either going to hit it or you're not that first time and if you're not we're not going to we don't want to put you together with that person again yeah uh -huh. and my that to me goes against one of the pleasurable things in life, which is to have a friend or someone you see, you know, periodically rather than just one epic time. Mm -hmm. And so I always push to try to be involved with like with someone I dig to like try to do, you know, more than one record with. Yeah. So like the, the Dixie Chicks and I wrote a ton of songs for that album called uh, Taking the Long Way. Yes. And we um and that was very gratifying for me and we got to know each other really well and it was like fun to be part of the recording sessions for that yeah um same with adele and 21 we wrote a bunch of songs that 
you know, for that record. And they used three of them on the record. And what song? Um, what songs were those? Just, just uh, so people are listening. Someone now. like you. Uh-huh, someone yeah. like you. Don't you remember? And one and only. Just, uh, just the best ones, you know. No big it's deal. Pretty good songs, you know. <laughs> um, this is dropping someone then, like, like you in there, yeah. Like, like, uh, like Leon Bridges. I've written a bunch of songs with Leon Bridges. Yeah. I'm really glad. He's, I'm really glad to have that as a sort of ongoing part of my musical life. He's a lovely guy and so so wonderful to collaborate with. And in such Alec a Benjamin, yeah, same such thing. A, I, Leon Bridges is such a refreshing stream flowing through yeah. the music. Yeah. So when you scene. Yeah. when you work with the artist, are you working just directly with that artist or like their whole team? So like, is Austin Jenkins there with Leon Bridges? Or sometimes we've he's been uh, and he he and I and Leon have done a couple of sessions where the three of us wrote a song together. That's awesome. and that he's, good things have happened from that. And sometimes I've written with Leon and Ricky Reed and maybe Nate Mercero when when. Austin wasn't there, uh-huh. you know, various, yeah. various things. And sometimes there's, you know, usually like three people or That's maybe cool. four yeah. with Leon. Some people are different. Some people really like to write just one-on-one, just like a two-person co-write. Uh-huh. And you, you start to, you maybe less, like if it's with Leon and, and it's at Ricky Reed's studio and it's like, Nate is there, you have, and I'm there. Then you have like, you could make the whole record. You have every instrument yeah. covered to yeah. make it sound really amazing on that day. Sometimes that can be nice to, to just have that group dynamic on a recording rather than, you know, I'm writing a song with one person and then I guess we're making a demo, but we're, but I'm kind of uh, playing half the instruments and they're playing the other half. And it's, it's yeah. less of, to me, it's like less, more like a demo if it's just all overdubs, you know? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's so fun. So are you doing, are you doing this live for the majority of the time? Like you're sitting down in the same room with somebody, you do the thing where you oh, send yeah. tracks to each other and, you know, kind of like pen pal songwriter. So not, not, there's some, uh, sometimes like during the pandemic, I did a lot of songs by, by mail, by zoom. Mm-hmm. But, um, Zoom. As soon as we could, we started to, right. started to get back together yeah. in person. And then afterwards, you know, you can, if the person lives in a different city, you can, you can rewrite the second verse with them on the phone, you know, or send them a bunch of voice memos and they can collate and figure out which is the best stuff and they, they can put it in. And it's, it can, it can start out with that clean one-on-one experience and then go to a kind of mopping up <laughs> yeah. you know approach yeah. afterwards you know how do you how do you keep notes or how do you notate your ideas and keep track of those things catalog hooks um, or lyrics things like that mostly um uh voice memos okay yes. good I'm, just, I'm glad that <laughs> i'm glad to see that yeah, mostly voice memos, and 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 once I figured out, I, I had to go online and ask everyone in the world how to copy all the song because because my iPhone will no longer update the voice memos from the voice memos app into iTunes, which is really annoying. Wow. But I went online and and crowdsourced the solution, and so now I can batch, I can batch download into my computer from the phone, and I, I just have them in folders. But I love being able to put them into a giant folder, song ideas. How do you do that? And put I, it on shuffle. Like put it on shuffle and just listen to the whole. Like, I didn't even know you could do that. How do you do that? Is it what? We got to link uh, it. In the show fig- notes. Yeah, he figured it out. I want to make an app that's similar to voice memos that you can just store things in files and. There's got. I, I, I like, there's got to be an app I for that. Tried it. I mean, Dropbox. Tried, you can like link it, but. They usually have too many features. They're usually yeah. like trying to be all things to all people or there's yeah. not enough. Basically, it's the three of us and like 900 other people really need this product. And so that's not true. Like, yeah. not it's not. Happen. There's so many people that need this product. Well, he we said 900. I bet it's around you <laughs> yeah. know, maybe 1100 or something like yeah, that. So okay. Still, yeah. So even so. Still, but, yeah. <laughs> you guys know you probably design a pedal and you're like, how many people are going to want this one? And you, literally, I thought you can do the math in your head really fast. Oh, yeah. We've released some where we've said probably 50 and then we sold mm. 
50. Yeah. <laughs> so we were dead. We were dead. We were dead uh, on the money. Sad to be right oh, in that case. Man, yeah. I want to be right every time. Yeah. One of my, er, one of the early projects was a, a dual phaser. Yeah. And it was a phaser, you know, running in, uh, running in series with, into another phaser. And it was, I was like, this is going to be, nobody's going to want this pedal. And then lo and behold, you know, it costs more to make than we made back on it. And <laughs> it's, I've got a bunch of them back here. It's called the Vanguard. Vanguard um, but it is. It really is yeah. still too far out of its time. You, yeah. gotta, you yeah. might just have to wait. Yeah. On all of our business cards where we go to trade shows, we have pedal art, different pedal art on everyone's business mm. cards. And I've, I'm stubborn and I still have the Vanguard on my business card. Sticking you know? with it. People does are like, it, I have does, does it have... Now. Is it in quotes underneath the company name? It says makers of the Vanguard. Oh man, <laughs> it, should. That, <laughs> it really should. Oh. Wouldn't that be? <laughs> wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? On all of our packaging, just yeah. makers of the yeah. Vanguard. Yeah, the fine people that brought you the Vanguard pedal. <laughs> oh my! Oh, so have you ever project. have you ever written a song that you're mildly embarrassed of that had radio success? I am among the luckiest people in the songwriting biz because that's never ever happened to me and either i'm so shameless that i think they're all bangers or <laughs> yeah. i just have been spared you know th having creep be my first smash you know what i mean i like the radiohead were yeah. sad about the first smash I, I i've never had that feeling but i know it happens i know it's real totally how do you this will be my uh i got to like two more questions for you i hope it's okay okay um how how do you know, like, do you know that you're on to something you know, like in the early stages when you hear a melody or you have some lyrics, like, how do you know there's magic on the idea? Like, what's that feel I, like? I think it's interesting because, uh, because if I, okay, first of all, I usually overestimate the amount of magic that's happening. As one does. Which is, might, might yeah. be helpful. Like, you know, this is sure. so dope. You know, like, no, yeah. it's not. But, you know, <laughs> otherwise you never, never finish, you yeah, know. Totally. But anyway, I think I usually overestimate. But then secondly, I always forget that if I'm working on something and I wish that I could play it for so-and-so, so like, oh, God, I wish I could play this for my, you know, friend or, you know, I, I always forget that that's basically the test. Like if I get, wow. if I have that feeling in a session, I wish I could play this for my friend. Yeah. Then actually it's a great song, but I always forget that that's the test. So I just have it as an independent little <laughs> thing of like, Oh, I can't wait to play this for, you know, for my wife or for uh -huh. you know, my friend or whatever. And I never then go to the next step and go, Oh, that means it's really great. You know, I guess. <laughs> that's a great, I like that. That is great. Yeah. So yeah. uh, my last question today, unless you have a last question, no, last question. No, well, my last question today, I think, I think kind of the, the most helpful thing that, that you host in that sweet, awesome brain and heart and mind of yours is, hmm. is for songwriters and producers. So, uh, so say you're talking to songwriter, songwriters and producers that uh, are maybe a, several years behind you and, and a little budding and aspiring to do maybe what you're doing. What is something yeah. that people should stop doing or start doing and or both um, in their in their efforts and their quest to, to maybe have a career that might look like yours? I think a lot of my things that I would say, like, I don't, I don't know if you guys have seen my, my deck of cards with advice on it. I think I have like, do you guys know about this? No. No. Okay. Tell us I'll something. show you. I'll show you. What okay. It's world? called, it's called, it's called wor words and music in six seconds. And it's, it, 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 it's a long second. story. The title is a long story, but it's basically like, it's like, let's see, maybe I'll take one out, one out randomly and we'll see if it's one of, if it's something I would say to people. Who's, oh, okay. Who's, There's a good piece of advice. These, who made these cards? Me, this is my shit. Okay, so this oh one my says, gosh, I love this. This is amazing. This one says, this one says, make it briefer and briefer until you can't leave anything else out. <gasps> oh, that's a just, good one. Can't read we some we more should of those. start ending our podcast <laughs> just reading one of these. Will you? Okay, so here, here's another one. This is this is another good one. Question: You've written a great song. What do you do next? Answer: Write more. <laughs> <laughs> kind of annoying, but it's true. Yes. Um, let's see. I'll do. I'll do one more. No. Do like. Uh, do, okay. Give us two or three more. We we okay. just found out about this. <laughs> okay. okay. So so um this one says, uh, 
Don't worry too much if your songs sound similar to one another. It's called having a style. It's a good thing. Dig it. That is great. Because I worry about there's that. Like, there's like 70, 70 is something of them. Yeah. Oh, here, here. Uh, here's the last one I'll read. Because this is actually something that I might, I might, I might say would be a legit thing to say to the, you know, that the hypothetical, hopeful musical artist. Yeah. Uh -huh. This one says, um, every time I've tried to make music that obeys some rule book of success, that music has failed in the marketplace. But when I've followed my artistic, in, my artistic instincts, amazing things have happened. Hmm. Hmm. Is, is, that, is the hmm on there? The, the hmm yes, is there. Yes, it's yeah. on there. <laughs> You've read Good. some of these on your Instagram account, haven't you? Yeah. I okay. Read them yeah. On the Instagram I, once yes, in a while, that's yeah. right. I have seen these. I didn't realize yeah. that was your cards. Can you that's, buy? Can yeah. you buy these cards? Yeah, these are they're on Amazon. It's, it's you know it's, it's yeah it's it's nice. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, they're this on Amazon. I, I, I'm going to go on one Amazon. One of my most gratifying things. What is it in, called? In, what do you type in Amazon words, to find these? Of, of, words and music in six seconds. Words and music in six seconds. One of my favorite things that happens in my musical life is when I get a, a like a, a random Instagram DM or or an email to my website or some somebody reaches out that I don't know and they say, I just wanted to tell you, Today at the session, we were kind of stumped and we took out your deck of cards and just for just to see what happened, we randomly chose one and it solved the problem entirely. Really? And we're so wow. grateful to you. <laughs> That's so great. Yeah. That's you so don't great. even need to be there to help out other artists. <laughs> right. Good. Right. And I, yeah. So and plus, cool. I'm actually, I'm like the kind of person if, if, if anyone says, are there any movies you've always wanted to watch? I'm like, uh, like I never can remember. Yeah. And if someone said, is there any advice you'd, ever, you'd want to give a young, you know, songwriter or a musician or whatever, you know, to help them on their way, like you did, Colt, I would go, um, I, you know, I never know. So now I have this deck of cards, I can just take it out and like say, okay, I would say this, That's is what awesome. I would say. That is amazing. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, so for all of our listeners, go and look at words and music in six seconds uh, on Amazon. Go ahead and buy those. Uh, are you guys... Do you tour? Are you going to be out on tour ever? Do you? Semisonic is, we have some shows coming up in Minneapolis at the end of the month. I've written a whole bunch of new songs. I'm pretty excited. And okay. then we're going to do, we're going to do some, uh, several weeks of touring in the summertime that we'll announce at some point. But I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy to have the chance to do this again. Are it's you really coming nice. to Oklahoma City? <laughs> oh, I don't think so. I think we're. He's like, most of the shows just, are going to be to the west of hitting. that. He's like, we're just doing A market, bro. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no C market. I get it. I get it. <laughs> Maybe Dallas if you're lucky. That's how it usually, usually works out. Um, okay. Well, catch, cool, guys. catch Semisonic out on tour uh, this spring yep. if you're in Minneapolis. The summer. summer the show, yeah. yeah, the summer. If you're in Minneapolis, yeah. go to a show. Other than that, get on All Music and type in Dan Wilson and go down the rabbit hole like we did. Yeah, so, it was a lot. Fantastic. Hey, thanks for being on the show today. Yeah, thank you. I really you. appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Awesome. Nice. In your so case, nice to to you. I, looking at your resume, I literally believe that an hour spent with us is two songs not written. So thank you for <laughs> not writing two songs oh, in, in being on the podcast today. It's really nice. appreciate Such it. Such a pleasure. Well, you're, I love the, I love the gear you make. It's, it's, um, it's in my um, pedal board over there. There's a whole bunch of them hooked up. I, I just, it's been so cool to discover um, yeah. the, the pedals. It's just been wonderful. So I'm, I'm happy to talk to you guys. Well, really thanks. Cool. Thank I you. appreciate that. Awesome. awesome. All right. Thanks for being All with right. us today. See you. Thank you. Thank you.